Once upon a time, in a faraway land. What are fairy stories? The strange and wondrous place where nothing is as it seems. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest? Fairy is a perilous land. Before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep it well. It is the place you visit in your dreams. A world of dream. myth and magic. But when the clock began to turn the night, sailed down through the sky. A mysterious voice began calling to the sad princess. She pricked her finger with her needle. Three drops of blood fell on in the In a trance, window. she followed the haunting sound the of the winding tree. stairway to the top of the you tower. You can read along with me in your book. Let's begin now. Well met, witches. Welcome to Storybook, Sacred Lore of Witchcraft. Today we have a guest in our circle, author and practitioner Jake Richards. Jake, are you able to let listeners know a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm an Appalachian conjure man. I'm originally from uh, here in East Tennessee. Uh, I have three published books, uh, Witchcraft, Conjure, and Folk Magic from Appalachia, uh, Doctoring the Devil, um, Notebooks of an Appalachian Conjure Man, as well as my third and most recent, which is a republication of a 1890 um, American folk healing manual, uh, which goes along in the same, like the American Grimoire tradition. So it pulls from uh, Albertus Magnus' Egyptian secrets as well as john holman's the long lost brain so i add that very and try and bring it into a more uh, modern context sure sure that's incredible and returning panelist dave gaddy the weathered wise man hi dave why don't you go ahead and take it away hey uh it's good to have you with us jake um and i've introduced myself a million times on here so i mean it's just repetition for me <laughs> but um Tonight, we're actually covering a folk tale that you supplied from your family history, um, and it's called Lick Paul, Lick Paul, which intrigued me. Can you tell me a little bit of the, the history of the story? Um, so the, the story itself was, it like actually happened to my third great-grandfather, Sidney Bryant, and then he passed the story on down to his daughter, Myra. She passed it down on down. On down to uh, her daughter Lois, which was my great grandmother, and on and on down to me. Nice. And in reading the story, trust me, this resonated so much with all the Southernisms and all the the information that was in there. So, in the story, you say that Sydney was a circuit rider preacher. For those that may not be familiar with the circuit rider, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so back in the day, the mountain communities were scattered and, you know, not very close together. Some places had schoolhouses and churches, other ones didn't. Um, so they would go around, you know, the mountainside on horseback, visiting these small communities, doing baptisms, sometimes funerals, especially if it was over the winter and they had, you know, kept the body in the barn or something because the ground was too hard to dig. Um, and sometimes even marriages. Um, so they would, you know, show up in these towns and stay for a couple of days to preach, you know, some sermons here and there. And then they would, you know, hitch back up on their horse and continue on. Um, and so Sidney was a circuit rider and because he was a, he was a Baptist preacher. So every few couple of weeks out of the year, cause you know, it took a while to go to all these different communities and everything. Um, so he would do that, you know, in his attempt to take the gospel to him, um, you know, everything like that. Which brings up an interesting um, question that I wanted to ask you. I know that in Southern Appalachian folk magic, there's a lot of using the Bible. Um, how do you do, how do you incorporate it into your practice? Um, well, first and foremost, um, uh, because nowadays a lot of people have, 
you know, very, you know, understandable issues with the church and with the way in which the Bible has been uh, used to legitimize, you know, genocide, atrocities, everything like that. Um, so I think first and foremost, especially if you're coming into Appalachian folk magic or into the family practice and trying to utilize the Bible, is first and foremost understanding that it is not 100% spirit inspired. Nothing ma made by man can be 100% without bias, without stain, without blemish. So, and you also have to understand it like in the, um, like the like the the historical context of what was being written, because some things were you know meant to be as rules for a certain class of people, not for everybody on the face of the planet. Um, while other things were simply meant to be purely spiritual or uh, you know allegorical, like Jesus only taught in parables. You know the stories he taught doesn't mean that it actually happened. It wasn't actually real he was trying to get a point across um so you need to kind of view it in that way and essentially apply kind of apply it to your life so if you are because that's why i always use the 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 lord's prayer because it addresses every single thing within human life that you need, whether it's protection, food, shelter, peace, healing, protection from enemies, whatever it may be. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, all around general prayer that can be applied to anything, whether you're um, trying to stop the flow of blood, but you don't know the blood verse, you weren't taught it. Um, trying to protect the home from uh, paints, evil spirits, the evil eye, anything like that. Um, but because the, the, the Bible, first and foremost, had a lot of significance for the old folks back then, because a lot of them didn't know how to read. Uh -huh. And they did know how to read. They learned how to read from the Bible. So their parents taught them how to, you know, speak and talk and read and write from the Bible itself, because that was most of the time the only books that people had. Um, so, because it was the, what they believed was the Holy Word of God, they believed that the Word itself had power, especially if they didn't know how to read. Mm -hmm. That was something mystical to them that, you know, um, so it further applied power to it. So they would, you know, write down uh, pieces and bits of scripture and attach it to like the inside of your shirt or slip it into your shoe. Or they would uh, fold it up real tight and tuck it behind the, I don't know what it's called. It's like the the piece of wood around the door frame. Mm -hmm. Or is it that? I don't know the actual word for it. But they would slip it between there and the wall for, you know, protection, blessing, whatever it may be. Other times they would uh, write down a healing verse and soak it in a glass of water and then have the person drink that water. Because it was believed that even if you just hand copied down the words, those words in that order still hold power, mm -hmm. even if directly taken out of the Bible. Because that was most of the time seen as, like, to deface the word of God in any way. Cool. So, Sydney, uh, your great grandpa Sydney, is this the one that could stop bleeding? Uh, no, that was that my uh, father. He was the he was also a Baptist preacher, but he was free will Baptist. Okay. Uh, so he's the one who could uh, stop the flow of blood. Okay. Cool. Really, the only thing I know about Sydney was the story that was passed down. Um, and then it was his daughter, Myra, that I talk about in my books where uh, she was like basically kicked out of the church for getting caught wearing a man's hat and I didn't under her dress. Uh, it was and then her daughter, uh, Lois, who was my great grandmother, who I would spend uh, a lot of summer in my childhood uh, in western North Carolina at the foot of Devil's Nest Mountain. 
Um, but then it was Lois daddy or Lo- yeah, Lois's daddy, Lonus. Um, a lot of L's in that family. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a, he was a herb doctor. So he would, uh, you know, study, use herbs for healing things and everything. Okay. How, how old do you think you were when you, uh, first were introduced to this story? Oh God. Um, I think it was five or six. It was one of the uh, few stories that Nana always pulled out whenever we would go and stay the night with her down in Greenville. Um, yeah, it's pretty sure five or six. So I, I loved it because, you know, it reminded me of uh, early folklore. Like I could imagine Washington Irving or Edgar Allan Poe, you know, writing something really similar about the folklore of the times that they lived in. Um, what do you think like always made it memorable for you and how has it affected you as you maybe taken on a role closer to the antagonist? <laughs> um, I want to say that it was pro- that as well as the other stories that she would tell us like uh, Red Eyes and Bloody Bones or called i think it's called taily poe or something i think that's the actual name of the story about the thing do you know what i'm talking about Dave? yeah i've heard that that name where it's like a, as she told us it was a woman and an old man who lived in a cabin way up in the mountains and they had been digging in the garden that day for potatoes and they found this real weird potato that kind of had some hair on it but they didn't think anything of it. So they, you know, cooked it all up and ate it. And then later in the middle of the night, the woman woke up because she heard something coming like from one of the outer rooms. And she tried to get the man to wake up, like wake up and go check what that is. And of course he wouldn't get up and check. So she had to get up and check. Um, And she goes and she searches and she follows the sound throughout the house. And then she gets up close to the chimney or like the fireplace, and she looks up, and then she sees these two big red eyes. No way, I'm telling the wrong story. Shit, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut it out. That's fine. <laughs> <clears throat> no, there was a single old man living in a cabin by himself, <laughs> and uh, he, you know, same thing. He found the thing that looked like a hairy tater and he cooked it up and ate it for dinner and he goes to bed and he wakes up to this sound of scratching outside of his cabin saying i want my telly po and it just goes on through the story that it's like this weird creature thing that's like you ate my big toe <laughs> like but, you know, that's so typical of Southern stories like that, though. I mean, especially from the mountain folk. I mean, Get a mix up. But it was always about somebody coming back wanting something. <laughs> and, I mean, it sounds like your grandma and your your family told the same type of stories that mine did. So with this one in particular, Lick Paul, when I first read the title, I was like, I know where this is going. I know exactly where this is going. So your great, great, great grandpa, Sidney, was circuit riding. And he stopped by this woman's house looking for shelter and looking for food. So she gives him shelter in the place out back. And tells him that before he goes the next morning, she's going to cook for him. Just kind of giving it an overview. Um, But in the middle of the night, he sees this black cat in the window. He opens the window because it's stuffy in there, and he sees this black cat in the window. And the cat's cleaning itself, saying, lick, paw, lick, paw. So then... Mm-hmm. I'll lick, paw, come exactly, in, Tom. Lick, paw, lick, paw, come in, Tom. So tell me a little bit more about what you think your grandpa's reaction was and, and how this affected you as a kid. Um, 
Well, because obviously I was also interested in Harry Potter, but also hearing that weird witchcraft element in the folk stories whenever we would go to Nana's, it always, you know, interested me. Like, um, you know, well, it's, you know, it's obviously not like Harry Potter, uh, but there was always something to it. Um, so that's what kind of pushed me into, you know, studying uh, and analyzing different folk tales, especially the ones from my family. Um, you know, whether it was like shape uh, shape shifting witches who could turn into deer, birds, turkeys, hogs, black cats, black dogs, you know, whatever. Um, there always seemed to be like that underlying element of uh, some kind of creature or animal that for centuries, ever since, you know, the coming from the old world in Europe, had these ties to like the underworld, the dead, uh, you know, the cemeteries, the devil. Um, so it always, I don't know, it just like fascinated mm -hmm. me. Um, like with this story, as much as, as much as I've analyzed it, uh, because in the story, the first black cat jumps up and licks his paw and goes, lick paw, lick paw, come in, Tom. And then he hops in. Uh, and then another black cat jumps up and says the same thing, and so on and so forth, until the entire shack is filled with, you know, these saw black cats with big yellow eyes just looking at him. Um, but I always wondered, because if the woman was the witch, and she was the one turning into a black cat, or into the black cat, Tom, as far as I understood it, meant like mm -hmm. a tomcat, like a male cat. So, as far as it's my understanding, because, um, you know, each time th I was ever told the story, some small details changed here and there, um, you know, depending on whatever it was that she remembered, you know, after five generations of the story coming down to us, uh, was that I think the very first cat that jumped up in the window mm -hmm. was her, and then she was Tom Katzian who I guess in cat form would have been like her imps or her, you know, servants yeah. given by the devil. Which that makes sense. I didn't, I didn't think about that, but with the first cat being her and then saying, come in Tom. I mean, that does, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you pass those stories down now? I mean, uh, granted other than the book, I mean, did these go to nephews yeah. and cousins? And... Yeah. As soon as they're old enough and they can kind of, you know, get that it's a story and, you know, everything like that. Because EJ right now, he's the oldest. He's four. So he's he's almost getting there. But I plan to have my grandmother, like, record her telling it. So, like, they can, you know, have that experience of the storytelling mm -hmm. from her, if that makes sense. So how did these folk tales, how have they influenced your practices? Um, well, I don't think Sidney ever thought that one of his descendants would, you know, end up, you know, in this. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's not that I'm making packs with the devil or something like that. I'm more so taking the veil away between what was considered of God and what was considered of the devil. Because at the end of the day, they were the same thing. Um, because, you know, what the, what, what the witch did and what the preacher or the power doctor or the conjure man did mm -hmm. was essentially the same. It was just who people thought the power was coming from, whether it was God or the devil or some, uh, you know, bad unseen force. And I think that comes, I mean, like we talked earlier, um, my background is religion. So I can remember, especially with my own grandma, it, a lot of people would look at it as good or evil. There was no in between. But yeah. in Appalachian folk magic, there is an in between. I mean, it's 
it's I think it's all in how you see that energy and that magic. Because I mean, we were taught. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times did you hear growing up, "The devil made me do it"? I mean, yeah, that to me alone. I mean, you're looking for a scapegoat, but within my own personal practice, I mean, it, energy is energy. I don't put it either good mm -hmm. or bad. Well, see, I think that's one thing that I find fascinating about Appalachia is that in most places, people were, you know, they weren't able to read generally. Um, what they were able to read mm -hmm. was generally the Bible. Witchcraft came to be treated in much the same way in Appalachia as it was in the Bible, because the Bible is biased when it comes to magic. Um, because the, you know, the same works that the pharaohs were doing, Moses and Aaron mm -hmm. could do too. So it's more so that magic was allowed, um, especially by the priests of the temple, when I believe it's in the book of Leviticus, when a man brings his wife to the priest of the temple because he believes that she's been unfaithful uh, and that. Uh, I think she was pregnant. I can't remember. Um, so the priest takes up dirt from the temple and mixes it in a glass of water and gives it to her to drink. And if she has been faithful, nothing will happen. If she has been unfaithful to her husband, then it was said that her thighs would rot. Um, but at the same time, you know, the same type of stuff is being done by the priest of Egypt. Um, so it was more so that any kind of uh, magic or anything done under the authority of the God in the Bible, Yahweh, was accepted and tolerated, whereas anything else was other witchcraft. It was visiting soothsayers and everything like that, which soothsayers, divin uh, people who div uh, do divination, well, I'm <laughs> the thumbling over my words, uh, were essentially doing the same thing that the priests of the temple would do when they would cast lots to see which heifer to mm -hmm. offer to God. So, up in the same in Appalachia, where it again simply depended on the context and under whose authority it was believed that the person was working. And if I'm not mistaken, I mean, a lot of the, the ministers and the preachers were doing some of the magic work too um it was just it was part of the process and it was it wasn't something that was looked down it was just it looked at as something that was a power given by god yeah and as long as it was generally done under god it wasn't seen as some ignorant superstition or anything like that so practices like that were still carried into uh like bigger cities like knoxville or nashville or Asheville. Uh, whereas the superstitions of the people who still lived out in the country were regarded as ignorant and, you know, without, uh, like without, mm -hmm. uh, like factual basis. So one thing I wanted to ask about the story is there's a lot of good information in here, but what, what can we glean from this story? What can we learn as far as, um, what kind of magic can we take away from it? Uh, what do you mean like exactly? With, the, with all the cats showing um, in the room and, and the heat from the bodies of the cat just emanating so heavy in the room. And then your great, great, grand, great, great, great grandpa, Sidney, um, trying to think what was it he did. He cut the, the one foot off of the cat. And then they started either disappearing or going out the window. So is there a lesson that was always that was taught to y'all through this story or was it more for entertainment or? For entertainment, especially uh, like as the fall season started to come. Um, but I think the lesson that I've gleaned from it in, you know, trying to analyze it and sitting with it for years and years is that like 
kindest people can still turn out to be yeah. your enemy. Like, if someone turns out to be your enemy, they were your enemy from the start. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. So was was there ever a doubt in your mind whether the woman was a witch or shapeshifter when you when you heard or thought of the story? Um, not when I originally heard it or anything like that. Uh -huh. uh, but that is always, you know, the possible case that, you know, it was just a coincidence or mm -hmm. didn't necessarily see what he saw or, you know, it was a dream and it just happened to be coincidence that her hand was also injured. Uh -huh. But the story went along that he took the black cat paw out of his pocket. Yeah. Yeah able and accused her of being a witch. And if I'm not mistaken, she never denied it. <laughs> we'll see that poison was that he accused we, her of a witch and then that was the end of the story. So we don't know. <laughs> we don't know how she reacted. We don't know if she, you know, skipped town or what he did or anything. So I don't know if like the ending of it just got Lost through the generations, or what? I love it. It's more yeah, effective. Kind of leaves in you a with sense. that question in the back yeah. of your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, I mean, it, 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 and I, I, I didn't mean this in any bad way. Like, it reminds me of like the best uh, of of the early American stories, like Nathaniel Hawthorne and and Washington Irving and stuff. Like, it has that it it has that historic feel to it. You like kept the black cat paw or yeah. like kept it around as like i don't know some form of protection against witchery and witches and everything which would then you know lead further into the folklore mm -hmm. of black cats in appalachia so i yeah i have never heard heard this story before, before you know before you submitting it but i do know you've talked about black cats in your in your writing and 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 from other sources on in american folklore you know i I hear about like like the the black cat spine bone and things like that. So, what I, could you tell us a little bit more about the significance specifically of the black cat? It, you know, in these times and in Appalachian folklore. Yeah. So, I mean, there's still the superstition today that black cats are unlucky, whereas there's also the contrasting uh, superstition that black cats uh, coming from Europe and the British Isles. Um. But in Appalachia, uh, black animals were always thought to both have this uh, protective and healing capacity while also being deeply associated with, uh, you know, haints, bad eyes, evil spirits, demons, devils. Um, the devil often appears as a, as a black dog or a black horse. Uh, in one story, as a, a black panther that came to reap the soul of this woman who is real mean to children. But in uh, like actual folk magic, it was always believed that the black that a certain bone in the body of a black cat was luck. Some stories say to boil the cat in a in a like cauldron at midnight in a graveyard. Um, you know, all sorts of. Uh, little small details that just had to be right. Like it had to be on a full moon sometimes. Um, other times you had to boil it until the bones sank. Sometimes you had to boil it until the meat just fell off. Um, but then the finding of the, of the lucky black cat bone was to uh, take the ent all of the bones, you know, obviously leave the, the meat and everything behind. And then you t would take it to a stream, sometimes one that flowed north, flowed west. There's hundreds of different variations. And then you would toss the bones into the water. And it was said that uh, as you were doing this, the devil himself would try to keep you from getting the lucky bone. Again, leaning back to both the black cat being for and against, you know, the devil or witchcraft. Um, and then it was said that it, once you drop the bones into the water, the lucky bone would either float, it would uh, float upstream, and a bunch of other things. Whereas other times you didn't boil the cat at all, the cat at all, you instead fried it, and then you would 
essentially eat it and while looking at the mirror. And then once you bit into the correct bone, you would essentially become invisible or all of your sight would be gone for a second and you would hear a voice in your, in your ear. All sorts of wacky shit. Mm-hmm. Um, can I cuss on this? Oh, yeah. Um, so knowing all, once I learned all of that, uh, you know, folklore and everything regarding the black cat bone, uh, I actually had a client send me, um, the bones of a black cat that had, uh, died on her property. Um, somehow, some way, um, so the bones were prepared and everything. And I have my black, my lucky black cat bone. So whenever I feed it, I kind of glean from that family story and kind of chant, Lick Paul, Lick Paul, come in, Tom. Lick Paul, Lick Paul, come in, Tom. So, yes, that's what we've been wanting to hear. <laughs> so funny enough, uh, I'm, from, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Chicago. And the, the, the folklore you're telling about the black cat is a lot more elaborate, like the stream and the floating against the water. but a lot of it is in urban folk magic as well that, you know, that I remember hearing. And I don't remember specifically if it was luck and gambling or if there was an invisibility Lies. aspect. Like putting little chicken bones and painting them black and uh-huh. L order companies and everything. Yeah, but we definitely, there definitely was folklore around boiling the whole black cat. And uh, in fact, my neighbor... Her her cat died, and I remember telling her, she was an artist, I remember telling her, maybe we can make art out of the bones, and so she put it in her freezer for me, and then it, it never happened, we moved or something, but I, I, thinking of it now, it, you know, I'm thinking about you, Dave, like, no, don't, look don't look in the, in the freezer. freezer, don't look in the pot, nothing. <laughs> but trust me, you, I've seen enough bones in a freezer, so, and enough full bodies. So Jake, you, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here. Um, since you're from Appalachia, you've got to have Scott's Irish heritage, mm-hmm. and the black Sith cat, yeah, is big in Scotland. And that's the soul stealing cat. Mm-hmm. So that it, it yeah. just it makes me think about how traditions travel over. And move into a different environment altogether. Because here you've got that soul stealing cat from Scotland, but then when you get into the Appalachians, you've got all these different stories and, and tales of the black cat. The black. And when you said that about the soul yeah. stealing, the cat stealing your soul, and that's also an old, well, I don't want to say an old wives' tale, but when a cat would get up in the bassinet of a baby, we, uh, my grandma used to say, no, mm-hmm. don't let that cat steal its breath. Mm-hmm. Steal the breath, right. Right. And then yeah. uh, white, white animals like doe or, or deer. And, and Jake, I know you wrote about like, um, so I, I'm familiar with them from fairy lore or Arthurian lore, you know, the hunt for the white beast or the white deer. But you mentioned how uh, sacred or feared or otherworldly they would be in it for the Cherokee, too. Yeah, for the Cherokee, it was believed that the, like the, like the solid white or the albino deer was both animal and spirit. And it was supposed to be the chief of like the deer clan. They called it little deer. Um, but there's also another variation down towards uh, Chattanooga a bit um, where there was this uh, white buck. It was an albino because the inside of its ears weren't pink and its eyes were blue. Um, but no matter how hard hunters would try and hunt it and you know shoot it, it couldn't be done. Um, so it, after a while, it ended becoming called the the bride deer simply because it was you know so so beautiful. Now in Cherokee legend, does shape shift and take part in that in, in the the white colored? Not really. Not that I recall. 
Yeah, but with the, like the Cherokee as well as the Scots Irish, the any kind of al- white or albino animal was always seen as being um, like other world, other worldly. Um, yeah, it just it's always had this weird, um, like mystical grip on people. Especially when, like, you're just in the woods alone, and then out of nowhere, there's this, like, you know, mystical beast right in front of you. No matter what science says, it's still, you know, a, it can be a very spiritual experience. I, um, I, I read Backwoods Witchcraft, and I enjoyed it a lot. I found it, like, encyclopedic with how much... Uh, content is in there like how how much uh theory and and craft is in there um i wanted to ask you a little more about the second book if, if you could explain it a little bit and 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 uh like what inspired you to write that write that one yeah um i really intended for backwoods to be kind of like uh the best introduction or primer that i could create for appalachian folk magic showing its inner um, you know, workings, ties, how there are usually random superstitions listed in random places doesn't mean they're not like there's not a like an underlying uh, cohesive system that at one point was understood by the majority of people. Um, so then in doctoring the devil i wanted to delve deeper into uh its actual historical roots and how it um you know would change from individual to inner individual so sometimes you would have uh, a preacher who was also a power doctor and could expel evil spirits and everything like that then you would have an herb doctor or yarb doctor who believed in both the medicinal and magical qualities of the herbs that they worked with Whereas then you'd have a yarb, yarb doctors who were, they believed in the power of faith healing and the medicine of herbs, but didn't hold, uh, believe that, you know, herbs had any kind of like magical quality to bring like luck or love or anything like that. Um, so it is simply varied from person to ber- person to person. Uh, so it didn't necessarily make them a witch. It didn't necessarily make them not everybody was a yard doctor just because they had a couple of herbal remedies that they did. Yeah, that was mostly common practice. Um, yeah, there were just different varying degrees that I wanted to highlight, um, you know, within the work itself, because there were always these, uh, each community usually had their own experts. So like this person is better at stopping the flow of blood, whereas this person is better at charming off wards and then this is who you need to call if you know you've been hexed and you want to get back at the witch or kill the witch and so on and so forth so it's kind of like you wouldn't hire a plumber to fix your roof like you had those specialized practices yeah but then i also in the second part wanted to uh kind of give a, a sort of like recipe book um, like different recipes, different workings for different things. And then at the very end, I include a index of a lot of ingredients used, uh, organized by, you know, like their properties or what their uses mostly were. So the same thing could be could show up for, um, being protective of evil spirits, as well as being protective against law enforcement or, uh, or unwanted guests in general. So that way people could, um, you know, kind of take those examples reading backwards witchcraft, understand the inner workings of it and simply use what they had on hand for like newer working. In newer working, have you come across practitioners um, who do not use the Bible or the Christian paradigm? And then, like, is it still, Ugh. like, is it still a- Appalachian folk craft? Like, what would you, it's a tough call, right? Yeah, there are those who don't. 
Um, but at the same time, of you know the like prayers or cures are traditionally done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, especially in um, you know rid of spirits or getting rid of pain. Um, and that to me is in my experience because for a long time here that has been one of the most recognizable authorities that mm-hmm. those troublesome spirits would recognize. Especially if they were at one point, you know, carnate and alive, they would recognize that authority of the Holy Spirit or the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, in my the you know, things that were traditionally done, like the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to, like, get rid of evil entities, or, you know, hang or anything like that here. Some, you know, pagan god that wasn't known about, but for, n- not even 50 years ago here. I just, I don't know. If it works, it works. Keep doing it. But it hasn't, um, I haven't, I haven't seen it. In my experience, I was going to say within the with in Appalachian folk magic, though, isn't that a big part of it? If it works, it works. Um, because, it, like you were saying, it does change from family to family and from person to person. Well, see the the main component of Appalachian folk magic is the first and foremost, thing, especially mm-hmm. in like the actual folk healing aspect. Um, whenever you're trying. Um, because even Jesus himself required the faith of the person who was being healed, healed. Like when the lepers or anybody would ask, ask him to heal, heal them, he would say, do you believe that I can do this? And they would say, yea, Lord, I do. Um, and then after he would heal them, he would tell them to go for okay. your faith has so made thee whole. Move, let's move that into modern practice. So, and then, would that fall along the same line as intention? Or is that a little bit is that a little bit different in your ass thought your your, your um, thought pattern? Mm-hmm. Oh, surface level, whereas faith that has been built upon and rooted for years and years, if not generations, it is something that is inherently a part of you. Like, it is ingrained in you. Whereas an intent is more so connected to, I need this right now. I want this right now. Um, where faith is both direct to what is needed, yet also open to possibility, open to the will of God. Whatever, that's why it's called trying, because it's not guaranteed. At the end of the day, you know, God has the last word. Um, so if it's that person's time, it's that person's time. If they're meant to go through this disease, they're going to go through this disease 100%. You can try and ease their pain. You can try and give them ease. But that's that's why, you know, regardless of whether you are creating a charm for luck or anything like that, the power always doesn't always come just from you. If it did just come just from you, you wouldn't need any help. You wouldn't need all these herbs. You wouldn't need all, um, you know, charms and sigils and seals and calling on these spirits and everything. You have to recognize that you you have to humiliate, you have to humble yourself, that you can't do it alone, and if you want to do it, you're not going to do it alone. I I like to respond to the um, everything is intention, usually with. Um, if if only if it's only our intention that counts, then why is the road to hell paved with good intentions? Well, and that was the, that was the old preacher and me being devil's advocate too. <laughs> yeah, you. Um, speaking of you know why are we using the herbs and and sigils and 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 uh, materia? Is there have you noticed a strong animistic mindset or? philosophy like with with the working with the herbs or is it more of a materialist um yeah. mindset 
um, animistic quality, not even just in Appalachian folk magic, but also in, um, you know, just like herb gas. You know, folks who would dig for like ginseng or golden seal or anything like that just to make ends meet, they would still follow a certain um, way or you know, rule book that just seemed to work for them. Um, so the plant was always respected. You were only gathered what you needed, what you absolutely needed. Um, because, like, even with ginseng, there was always the legend that because whenever ginseng starts fruiting its berries, and it's likely ready for, you know, harvest if it's, you know, uh, the plant has more than two prongs. Um, because the the ginseng um, normally likes to grow on, like, the northern side of the mountain slope. It also likes moist, uh, wet areas, especially outcroppings, which is also the same place that rattlesnakes like. And rattlesnakes are looking for their winter nest right about the same time that ginseng is ready to be hunted for. Um, so it was believed that because the rattlesnake and the ginseng are always uh, you're always living so close by together that they made a pact. And it was that if you hurt one, you hurt the other. Uh, or the other would, would exact revenge on you. So it was believed that if you if you over harvested ginseng or you disrespect it in some form of form or fashion, then you or someone you love would be hunted down by the rattlesnake and get struck. Whereas if you killed or hurt a rattlesnake, the ginseng would stop working for you. You would not get its health benefits. You would not get its energy. Anything you would you would just stop finding it to to begin with, because it was always believed that um, even that I was taught that it was believed that ginseng had like this mystical ability of hiding itself. It would only be found if it wanted to be found. So you could be in the middle of like a honeydew patch and you wouldn't see it. You literally would not see the plant. Whereas other times you would walk into the forest and it would be right there, just welcoming you. Um, so for things like that, there was always this animistic quality or this belief that, you know, this particular plant had you know some kind of uh sentient quality to it like it was intelligent that's why you go hunting for ginseng because some people even believe that ginseng would uproot itself and walk away to avoid getting harvested um so there was always this animistic quality um likewise even with deer hunting it's always i've always heard that it was extremely bad luck to kill or hunt an albino deer if you, if you happen to come across one. Uh, this is probably the most respected, uh, well, respectable thing about deer hunting um, is that, you know, th there's this um, rarity of nature and it shouldn't be hunted, especially for sport or to like hang on your living room wall. That's really interesting. Um, just north of where I grew up uh, in Wisconsin, just north uh, is just north of where I grew up. And we had um, ginseng hunters there, too. And I never heard about like their 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 more mystical practices or if they had any. But I do know it was a big um, it was a big source of income for for ginseng foraging in Wisconsin. So I used to hear about the hunters like wandering sometimes and you might come across them like camping that was like we would go to wisconsin to go camping so you know they might come by your campfire and tell tales and then yeah. keep going yeah um i mean some about dishes with the ginseng honey uh the first ginseng root that they ever, uh had ever found especially by accident for good luck hunting the ginseng um, other times they would look for certain plants that they believed were ginseng pointers <laughs> that, huh. you know, would apparently indicate that it was also growing in the area. Or they, they follow deer trails knowing that the deers would eat the berries and then along the line drop them, um, you know, after the digestive process. Um, and then if it was you know fertile ground and the ginseng would grow there so if you follow the deer trails you may happen upon some processed <laughs> ginseng 
how about um work with some of the like evil spirits you mentioned is there is there something similar to like the restless spirit or the intranquil spirit that might be sent on someone or or used to used to bother a lover until they submit to you is is there anything like that um not really um okay. it was always that if you work with the spirits you would safer to work with those that you knew in life and then you know, they would introduce you to those they knew in life because everybody's ancestors and beloved dead different based on generation um so like my uncle rick his beloved dad would include my great great grandfather uh oscar because he met and knew him in life whereas for me he would simply just be an ancestor because i i was never no, I was born long after he had passed. Um, so it's it was always um, tricky working. It's always tricky working with spirits you don't know, or they necessarily have um, like that kinship bond with, whether it was by blood or not, um, or whether they were incarnate or not. The, the closest thing to like an intranquil spirit in Appalachia would be the plat eye. I, it was essentially the it kind of like a haint on steroids. It was a person who was either a victim of murder and they didn't have a proper burial, or they just didn't have a proper burial, or you know something along those lines. Uh, and they just it's mostly just. Um, rage and anger and resentment and revenge that keeps them in that uh that spiritual state as opposed to a haint which w could just be like a pesky spirit that essentially doesn't know it's dead like you hear that weird noise because they still think they're living in your house and they're just trying to sweep the floors oh yes i grew up with haints constantly <laughs> And in the South, we have that one paint color, Hank Blue. <laughs> so it, along the same line, I know that in traditional witchcraft, there's what they call a fetch spirit. Is there anything similar in Appalachian folk magic? Which I think it would fall along the lines of probably um, what you were just talking about. The, not the really. Dead and the, the closest thing possibly would be like making a... Uh, doll baby and capturing a piece of that person's spirit in it or like the actual spirit of a root like if you make like a, a hand or a charm bag uh you have to keep feeding it or it was said that the the spirit would leave and find drink elsewhere especially like if you normally feed it with whiskey then i've had i've, had, I've forgotten to um like feed some of mine before lost them and then they turn up somewhere they should not have been um like on the kitchen counter or you know something random like that thankfully they came back sorry i forgot to give you your drink um because you it was it's like this embodiment of all of the energies all of the roots all of the herbs working together it somehow i don't know coagulates into like this cohesive spirit that you name to work for you to bring good luck anything like that um be the closest things to any kind of uh like fetch or um like egregore or, or you know anything like that until you just I'm used it uh, we've gotten so used to In the word poppet that we forget about the word doll baby that's such a yeah. an appalachian term i guess uh along those lines and actually, with the back uh, to the events in the tale, how about the sending forth of the witch's spirit or senses or consciousness? Um, the closest thing to come to that would be hag writing, and that was generally done to essentially torment someone in their sleep. Mm -hmm. Especially the like the hexerai traditions, you know, the Pennsylvania Dutch. So like they would essentially go out in spirit or as the old folk tales, you know, viewed it, they would slip out of their skin mm -hmm. and 
shoot it like um literally like their skin was just laying on the floor like a pair of pans um and that if you salted it they wouldn't be able to get in back uh back into it by morning i love listening to this this stuff <laughs> it just reminds me of my childhood <laughs> And then uh, Osman and Steel. So your your most recent work. How did that come about? Um, so I had heard mention of it from my grandmother um, that it was one of the books that Pavel would consult for, you know, uh, especially like the charms for stopping the flow of blood or taking off warts or anything like that. Um, and in researching it, I couldn't like find an actual copy yeah you know, it was hard to even find a picture of one of the like actual original copies um and it was only available in like random uh museums and libraries across the country and i think i was only able to find maybe five or six in existence wow. um but i was thankfully able to get a uh pdf copy of it and in going through all of the charms and recipes a lot of them looked familiar um so that's when uh i started digging further and found that a lot of them were sometimes entirely lifted from uh john homan's the long lost friend or uh, albertus magnus's egyptian secrets um so that's when uh you know i finally understood that it was kind of going along within the same family of grimoires that uh you know kind of borrowed from each other in almost a direct line or a direct lineage um but a lot a couple of them i also recognized as being uh charms that my grandmother would use especially after her leg surgery she would you know rub her leg and you know tell it to ease uh what is it uh Something about ease thou blood and bone like Christ in paradise. So basically telling the you know the pains to ease just as Christ is without pain in paradise. So I don't know, just it felt like it needed to be known again. Like it didn't deserve to um, be forgotten out of existence, and, you know, just shut up in random museums and libraries that is largely inex in inaccessible to people. And do you see it more as reference or um, experimental, experiential? Um, both. That's why I decided to add my commentary to not only tell people to not use some of the dangerous um, chemicals and minerals and things. We're in a, we're in a, 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 every, a situation right? now where people eat Tide uh, Pods, so you have to. Yeah. Well, yeah. and Datura Pods, so whatever. <laughs> Blossom, so whatever. <laughs> not, not a lot of logic in either. <laughs> At the same time, there are because a lot of people don't know still today about uh, like long lost or uh, Albertus Magnus Egyptian secrets because within the past like three generations, that knowledge has been kept. It hasn't been passed on, um, or you know the the heirloom copies haven't been found, or they've been lost, or they've just gotten rid. Because um, a lot of people still today are still superstitious about books like that, like The Long Lost Friend, or especially the sixth and seventh books of Moses. Um, especially with the times that we're in with the American healthcare system, um, people not having, you know, not having any kind of uh, like herbal storehouse so they can turn to for certain things usually was all people have her um you know like their faith um so i mean 
it still goes along the same lines that if it don't work, it don't hurt. You know, it's worth uh, trying out. Just like the the farmer's almanac and planting by the signs. You may think it's hogwash until, you know, you decide to plant by the signs and then you're like, holy shit, this kind of works. <laughs> you know? Uh, no, no right answer to this, but was there anything in Osman and Steel that you decided to try out for yourself? Um, I usually use the um, the one I just mentioned, the Ease Thou Blood and Bone, like Christ in Paradise, um, as well as some of uh, the variations of different charms from uh, the like the Long Lost Brand or uh, Egyptian Secrets. A lot of them, though, are very outdated, whether they use uh, turpentine, you know, mercury, whatever it is. Uh, so I did my best to try and uh, bring it into like a modern day use, um, especially like the one where uh, it's recommended if a person cannot hold their water, meaning they're wetting themselves. Uh, then it was you were to get a hog bladder, dehydrate it, and then powder it, and the person was supposed to take doses of the powdered hog bladder. And that was purely sympathetic because, as far as I know, there's no curative uh, qualities to a hog's bladder. Um, but it was purely sympathetic because the hog's bladder was so so huge, so large, it could retain a lot of water. So therefore, it would likewise help this person hold and retain their water. Um, but not, not everybody has a, a hog bladder lying around. <laughs> and then one, I can't remember what it was, uh, something about using a dog turd. Oh. White dog turd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody has ever used every formula and Osmond and Steel. Um, but it is also of great importance because it does come from how I uh, the Long Lost Brain Secret. It is also one of the only works in whole or in part by a woman because Osmond and Steel were a uh, mother-son duo. Um, but you can also see within the text uh, you know, little bits of the attitude of uh, commercialization and branding that they do, where they say that, you know, oh, this certain charm is, you know, worth more than $100, or this one was said to be carried by George Washington himself into war. Um, you know, just anything to try and, you know, get people to buy the book. Um, but to, that doesn't, to me, take away from the the possible usefulness and important qualities of the work itself. Whether they intended to or not, they created something that is still within the same family of American Grim Wars as the Long Fran or Secrets or the Six and Seven Books of Moses or anything like that. That's fascinating. And it sounds entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> Any? Are you doing any workshops, speaking engagements, classes? Um, possibly doing a couple next year. I believe in August. Uh, I may be doing a book signing soon here in uh, Elizabeth in Tennessee. Just work on other books. <laughs> any? Uh, any early? Uh, early notices about future books or too soon to say? Uh, I mean, I haven't proposed it yet. So, okay. Um, I got, I got a few more plans. They're just, that's great. That's good news. I work on this one. And then I keep getting inspiration for other ones. And it's like, I get this one written first. Can, can that, and then maybe you can send me that little spiritual invoice in, in a dream or while I'm asleep. or something. Well, a after this, mm -hmm. I think we might we might keep uh, pushing you for a little collection of folk tales. Let me tell you, this is this has been like oh, I got plenty of them. Good. I mean, 
Good. And I'm not going to lie, Jake. I go to bed at night listening to <laughs> audiobooks of yours. <laughs> I mean, I'm redo. I'm re-listening uh, Backwoods Witchcraft now. Uh, so. Thank. It'd be better if you read it, Jake. I know. That's what I was thinking. I was yeah. like, the audiobooks yeah, would be so much that, better though. if they were done in your dialect. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they would let me though. Because there's like a whole process where you like you gotta pay. And there is so. and, and and the equipment set up uh yeah. um and all of that. But yeah, it does it it would gain something with the uh with the mm-hmm. authentic reading. So if you do a book yeah. of folk tales in the future, look at getting the material getting the, the stuff for your sound studio. Yeah. Okay. I will. <laughs> Or turn it into a record. <laughs> turn it into a I'll, turn it into an album of folk songs, whatever. It's about uh, folk ballads. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is this has been amazing. I I, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed Backwoods Richcraft. I did not know I would ever have a chance to speak to you. So this has been a this has been a great treat. Um, Thank you, Dave, making this happen. Right now. And um, is there is there anything else you want to let people know before we get out of here tonight, Jake? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, I think we got it all. And how about you, Dave? Anything else you wanna you wanna say? Before Nothing we close other than the evening? regular. Just keep an eye out for classes coming up. The books coming out in early twenty twenty four. Um. And got some good stuff on the horizon. My final thoughts, as always, are until we next gather, may all your travels be filled with wonder.